We are recording. We are recording. How Mr. Great. Jeff Berlin. Good Thank morning. you for being here. Yeah, good morning. And uh, I, I want to know, first of all, how does a nice Jewish boy like you get into something like playing fusion? Uh, because, they didn't, <laughs> because they didn't stop me from doing it because I'm Jewish. My, <laughs> my father is... Uh, is a Holocaust survivor in a in a not in the sense that he was in a concentration camp, but because uh, my grandparents went to Auschwitz. But my father was an exceptionally resilient and smart guy, and somehow through that and a great deal of luck, he worked his way through Italy from Belgium and got to the Allies, and uh, he was uh, had a, an astonishing amount of uh, events happen to him, and so. Uh, you, you're joking. How did a Jewish boy like me get into fusion? I grew up hearing about how, you know, the Jews, they, they, they do this to us, they do that to, that to us. And it was a, took me a long time to recognize that uh, that is not the belief system of everybody. <laughs> but it was, in fact, uh, uh, my father's lessons to all his children. It wasn't a good one, but he's still alive and uh, he's in the world and... Uh, yeah, boy, I got into fusion because uh, it was a coincidence. It was jazz music that got me to become what I became. I started out in violin ten years. That's a Jewish boy. Uh, <laughs> the, the classic, classical violin. I was good at it. I was a symphony player. I mean, you know, regional symphony, mm -hmm. not the New York Phil. And uh, I was a recital violinist as a kid and hung out with classical musicians. And then the Beatles came along. I got into bass, and never played violin again. And then I went to Berkeley when at the time Berkeley only taught music. There was no other subject or other uh, area of, in, of, of uh, education, just music. Sit down and these are these. This is major and this is minor. And they opened my eyes to such a world. Then uh, when I got to New York, fusion hit, and I was an ex-violinist, ex-self-taught rock bass player, taught in jazz, and I fit right into the era. It was a it was a perfect storm. It was it's so interesting talking about fusion now and fusion then. I was I had John Etheridge on here, and he was and he was saying how you guys were making it up. You know there was no such thing as fusion. You just played jazz, and you had a certain kind of attitude, certain kind of instrumentation. And right now you learn it as a style, which is very funny because it's it's a sum of what you guys were doing in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Yeah. That really became formulized. Well, the formula occurred after the fact. And a lot of mm -hmm. music is like that, where something will come along and music inevitably changes. It always seems to be the case. So once it does and you identify what preceded the popular present style, you can say, oh, it was this, it was a fusion of rock, which it was, and jazz. And uh, so the term fit, I, I think Pat Metheny never liked the word, mm -hmm. as I recall. But I got to be honest, it's, it seems of an appropriate term for a joining of two different styles that had not been joined before that period. So I was a fusion guy, and, uh, and uh, I'm proud of it and grateful for the opportunity. I mean, you know, the great musicians I played with and who taught me and who guided me and who allowed me to play with them. I'm, I'm a fortunate guy, man. I really am. Of course. I became aware of you when I was 14. I remember in, I grew up in Israel. And you know what record was very popular in Israel? The no. Players, T. Lavitz. That was everywhere. You know, that that one was just everywhere, you know, every all the guitar players knew it because Scott was really big there. And, you know, that, I just I remember the bass playing right, really sticking out being like, you know, we didn't have things like that at that time. And it's just like, whoa. And from no, there, uh, but today it's, it's very common. I mean, there there are bass players today that are phenomenal. I mean, mm -hmm. and it's reasonable that it's so because the generations begat the next generation. And the guys that are playing today, some of these bass players can outplay me like 20 to 1 in terms of actual physical playing. And uh, so I, I had to find, I look for things. When people do this, I like to go here. If they use this amp, I'll use this amp. If they use this uh, 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 pickup, I'll use that pickup. Uh, you know what I mean? If they use five string, I'll stay to four. If they use active, I stick on passive. So I'm fortunate in that by not going the way of popular.
Oh, I lost you there for a second. Jeff? Jeff? Well, I think I just I, lost you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there you are again. So Got you back. I had so, to until you were saying that you were kind of dodging the other way. Oppositional by nature. Not oppositional. Seeking opportunity where people may not look for it. Right. Right. Uh, you know, speaking of Israel and... Uh, there's there's a a a, a, a guy a, an American tourist is walking down the street in Israel, and a Hasidic Jewish fellow is is walking towards him with with a melon under each arm. And the American guy says to the Israeli guy, he goes, "Mister, I need the post office. You know where the post office is? Can you tell me where the post office is?" And the Jewish guy says, "Here, hold these melons." And he gives him the melons. And the Jewish guy looks at the American and he says, "I have no idea." <laughs> You know who told me that? Pretty good. You know who told me that joke? The son of uh, Shamir per uh, Perez. Uh, oh, it's like Perez, the, our, the late uh, former prime minister? Yeah, his son. No way. That joke. <laughs> that's that's oh, funny. Um, it's like a Woody Allen thing. Okay, so in the... <laughs> that's funny. Uh, so you were in New York. This, this must be like the 70s, right? Yes, it was... It was the 70s, and it was a great time. Everybody how, was playing. How was the connect? How were the connections formed? I know you like the big, the big thing that happened for you. The first, the first big thing would have been the Bruford thing. It was, it was, it was. And this is around what time? 77. Okay. But I was in New York at, at the time, and all the guys were playing. And then I got with Bill, and uh, we. It was a great collaboration. I learned so much from him. I am grateful to the time that I was with him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, you know, how did, how did things roll from there for you career wise? It, I, I was a guy who uh, always sort of I, actually I reflected on it recently. I've always done the Eric Clapton sort of philosophy of playing. If you look at early Clapton before he became famous as an individual artist, he came in bands and left bands. He went in bands and he left bands. It, when bands were doing well, he would go, he would leave. Mm. And I'm not sure it was done for any other reason other than a seeking of a musical thing. And in this, in a sense, by decision of, you know, decisions that I made, I never got above this level in music because I never was, uh, I never stayed long enough in something to where I could build it into something great. I always had a sort of a, curious restless sort of a sense in music and i never stayed in anything long so i was a wanderer up till today maybe i'm still not in a band or have established myself as a 66 year old man where some of my colleagues have because i wouldn't stay put mm, just uh, had to like go from project to project was it like a staleness thing in the music or like what what does what, do you feel it coming on when you're in it i wouldn't call it staleness i would call it a need to know curiosities. I had this thing where, and this is personal to me, I wanted to know what was beyond what I was doing. Uh, I was in New York and building a very good career there. I was involved in the studios and playing with the top guys. And suddenly I packed it all in and moved up to Boston, Mass. Mm. And started to study with Charlie Benakis because I had to know about music, things that I, I didn't know. Now, this is just how I'm wired in my DNA. And there's been both positive and negative to it. And the positive is I've never stopped growing as a musician, as a bass player, as a, as a writer. as a, and, and I like that. I even have a new music teacher that I'll be studying with uh, starting in about a week. Who? I, I, huh? Who is he? Um, ah, I'll tell you his name. It's got to be like uh, classical music, right? That's exactly what it is. <laughs> exactly what it is. What's his name? Hold on. I, I mean, if you're curious, I just... Yeah. I, I don't want to delay the, the, the chat. Yeah. No, no. yeah. It's, it's, it's it on. We want to check it out. It has to be like arranging for seven chainsaws and three violins. Some, and something out of left field. And a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> JJ, JJ Perfume. Okay. Berthum. He's online, and I saw a video of his. He was talking about writing and 
breaking down certain aspects of composition. And I said, my goodness, I got to get with him. And he's a kid. He'll be my mm. grandson. So uh, he's a young man who I feel did it very well. He learned music and became such an expert at it in the area that he pursued that uh, I'm, I'm going to become a student. And I like that. I like these things. Oh, so I, I gave up that and I started to study with Charlie because that's the, the, the thing that I had. I wanted to know more about music that I didn't know. I always had the idea that career will succeed, and it has. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I wanted to know things. Can we talk about Charlie for a second? Because he was kind of a guru figure for the entire scene. And no, not a lot of people know about him now. I mean, I think what what I what I know is that he would mail people exercises and homework, and people would like snail mail it back. And you actually went to study with him in person, I'm assuming. But what what kind of teacher and person was he like? Well, he was a great guy. But the, the the funny thing about him is that in this sort of unassuming looking and kind of he's he was a humorous guy. Hey man, what's happening, man? <laughs> Hey, man, you've been practicing your approach notes. <laughs> you got to do it, man. If you're not going to do it, you ain't going to be playing, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so did Charlie. And packaged in this sort of humorous, quirky dude, man, might have been one of the greatest music educators of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century. I mean, one of the greatest minds that I had ever come across. And mm. Um, he was what's, a legend. What's unique to his approach? His approach was entirely based in the teaching of music. What he showed me. Is that you, Gabby? No. Sorry, I thought someone was knocking at the door. What he showed me and showed us all is th that our deficiencies were always based in musical unawareness. So I play for him or, or send him a. He, he dealt with cassettes, so I did a, a, a correspondence thing with him, too. And uh, when I moved back at when I moved out of Boston, excuse me, and he would say, I heard you play. Like, I remember this one very clearly. Hey, man, heard the tape, man. You're playing great, man. But you're playing too horizontal. We got to get you to play vertical. And I got it. Horizontal mm -hmm. means scales. Da -ba -da 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 da 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 That's why I'm sort of Lots not... Of steps. Scales, whatever that is, mm -hmm. rather than defining it as the, 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 the intervallic element of it, it's the nature of the linear line. Da -ba -da -ba -da 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 so half steps, cold steps are part of it. And that's why I'm not a big proponent of scales, because Charlie showed me that he didn't just say it, he showed me that the greatest players in jazz played vertically. Ba 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 da do da ba da do ba bo ba 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 da 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 do ba bo ba ba da do da, and that opened my eyes. And uh, a lot of the studies that I got were vertical type of harmony, in a variety of different ways. I've got loads of Charlie's stuff, and he changed my life with a piece of music paper that didn't have a note on it. Mm. It didn't have a note on it. Charlie changed my life. He, brand, he, he bracketed out certain sections showing you could phrase in a four-bar phrase in, in different ways. It was marvelous what, what he had opened up uh, uh, to me and to everybody. So that was yeah. kind of magic. It was music, and that's why I'm a big proponent of it when one pays to uh, be taught. Well, I think you, you put yourself in a position to expand right. awareness rather than to just be given some notes right. on paper, right? You're actually willing to change as a person when you put yourself in a humble position to actually study with somebody. That's a, that's a very uh, a good way to put it. I, I, humility is a part of learning to say, yeah, I don't know this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand this. And would I be better off to, as a musician by learning it? Um, a lot of guys today look at learning as practical in the sense that, well, I, I'm on this gig, and these are the songs, so why do I need to study when I play the songs? But I never looked at learning as attributable to performance, mm. because I can play the same songs as a lot of guys can, 
and do a good job at it because I understand, let's say, the idiom or guys like me. I'm not alone in this, that a trained guys or guys that learn music can play fairly well anything because we've raised the bar significantly, in my case, at least out of curiosity. And it's that beauty, beautiful, the beauty of curiosity that made me humble enough to say, no, I don't know what this is. So I, I, I learned stuff. I never did this in order to get a gig. I never did this in order to be employed or anything else. Because if you'll pardon me, I, I mean, I was capable of being employed, you know, in 1974. I mean, there wasn't really any, I could read and I could play uh, popular styles. So, I mean, I needed maturity as a musician. But if I went for the, for the gigs, I wouldn't have studied another note after I left Berkeley in 74, 75. Sure. You, let, let's discuss a little bit. You had some time with Alan Holdsworth, right? Mm -hmm. you, were playing, you were playing in road games. So, so I, I had the chance, you know, with, with Marvin, we were, we were his opening band in 2012, really at the last tour he did. And we were, I was personally kind of helping him out because he was having a rough time. But uh, you were with him in his prime. Yes, really, I'm... really. Can you can can we discuss a little bit like what what life looked like then on those tours and during those albums? He was young. He was fun. He was healthy. He was uh, Alan was a drinker. Oh yeah, and had been since early. I think it's what finally he succumbed to it. But uh, he was a uh, an alcoholic. Um, I he drank when we toured, but you know when you're young you don't. Physically, yeah, feel show, it. <laughs> emotionally show it. He was a, a vivacious guy, an experimental musician, and easily. He was a guy. In fact, I talked about him with somebody the other day, and the guy said Alan was a kind of a musician that sounded like he'd never heard anyone ever play guitar before. Mm. It's a compliment. He simply had nothing attributable to anything or anybody in his playing. That is originality. And it's a freak of nature. It's, it's a wiring thing. It's, it's the DNA that comes or doesn't. And we who do not have that propensity have to go to Charlie Binakis or some <laughs> such thing. Or what? you or I or whomever, you know. We, sure. yeah. and, so, and let me, let, let me ask you, like, being a bassist in a situation like that, what was like learning the music like? The, those, those charts, how would he communicate songs i mean it, it seemed like he was really in his own mind in a lot of ways uh, he did it by ear um I, I did it by ear he did it by ear he would just mm. wang 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 bang 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 and i'd go show me that again bang, bang. and uh i created parts or fit stuff and he would say yes or no and uh yeah well, you know, my cat just <laughs> that's pretty impressive i remember you know Hey, um, go ahead. I'm listening. Yeah, yeah. So I remember um, we were the tour we were on. We had Jimmy Haslip on bass, and they had our saxophonist Danny Markovich go on and play a song with them. And I think they were playing Fred or something. And we're all hanging out in the van, and Jimmy's just saying the chords to to Danny, and he's like, "Oh, that part's like a C minor." And then Alan's like, "C major," and then it's like, and then it's like a F half diminished. It's like. F diminished. And then it's like, what the fuck have we been playing all these years? <laughs> right, right, right. There seemed to not have been a lot of harmonic consensus, but the music was so out that they, I guess, didn't notice. <laughs> Which is hilarious. Uh, that's awesome. So I know that you, you had like a short run with Yes. Is that a thing? It was. Is that a rumor? Uh, they, uh, Tony Levin was playing with them and had gotten sick. And so instead of canceling the tour, ironically, it wasn't Bill Bruford who recommended me. It was Steve Howe. Mm. And they called me on a Sunday. And uh, actually, I still have the parts here somewhere. I saw them the other day. I was cleaning out my music drawer. And I wrote out, because uh, I'm a good transcriber. I've got uh -huh. stacks and stacks of transcriptions from my formative years. So I wrote out their show. It was very easy to do when compared to a McCoy Tyner or Keith Jarrett or stuff. Um, and... It prepared me to do yes, and I got the call on Sunday, and on Thursday I was on the road with them. How long was the tour? Uh, not terribly long. Okay. I recall a, a few weeks or something. Um, I think there's videos of it somewhere. 
And uh, I that was I went in, did that, and uh, and that's it, awesome. That was it. It was uh, a quick in and out, and uh, but it was yeah. a great experience. I, I was uh, actually in in, a, in big arenas and you know situations which I've never been in before. Yeah, so, that's that's a hard, hard, that We just did their cruise. We did cruise to the edge this year, and you know they oh. like it's their management that runs it, and they perform there. But they're all very old right now. <laughs> Are they? I can imagine. Well, we're all getting there. Look at me. <laughs> you look well, beautiful. My hair hasn't changed color. I'm 66, and I don't know why or what good grace I've had to have my hair this, you know, kind of long. Well, I, this, I and, and this is the color. I've never. I have a theory, uh, which is what we're about to get to. I think it's because you never used a metronome. Why? Well, that's it. <laughs> so, can we talk about this? This is something that's making you a controversial figure oh, in sure. the jazz world. And uh, you, you're a proponent of the idea that one should not practice with a metronome. And I want to I wanna understand why. Oh, well, because practicing by nature is to regard new information. That's what practicing, at least a great portion of it, is about. You get a lesson, and here it is, and you have to learn it. But since music is a performance art, um, when you put a click on, you're beholden to the click, not to your own uh, time, the time, not, not the time of the music, but one's time, one's ability to learn the music. You have to keep up with this or whatever or this or whatever you've got. This is the priority. The music isn't the priority anymore. So where I feel people are making a mistake is, is that they're performing on music they really shouldn't be performing on. And as an example, if I learned, if you get anyone who learns a second language, you know, I'm a Spanish speaker now. And if you get anyone who learns a second language, there's a time flow of speaking, you know, that 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 particular tempo of conversation. But you can't get a new Spanish speaker or a new French speaker or a new Hebrew speaker to speak in time. Can't speak Hebrew in time with you. If they don't know the words, so mm -hmm. if you're conversing and it's and there's a, a need to keep up, it's it's not a real good learning situation. It's a it's a it's a life or death survival situation. And I found, especially through uh, my time as a well, actually everything time at, uh, uh, as a violinist through Berkeley too, we practiced out of time. No one ever mm -hmm. mentioned, never saw a metronome at Berkeley in this in the early seventies that I can recall. I don't recall anyone using them in New York. They may have. Charlie never talked about it. I think he had one where this became three, and, you know, three, four, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So it was an ear mm -hmm. thing. It wasn't a time thing. So that's the controversy. People, I feel, making are making a mistake because they're confusing performance with learning. And that's why a lot of guys don't get better. It seems like, to me at least, it seems that time used to be regarded as something obscene. I mean, the mechanical elements of time. If you think about like classical music and you have a conductor that's really personifying some, something about the flow of time, and then slowly with time it gets, you have a drum set that's, you know, on a hi-hat, maybe keeping two and four, this, these steady points in time. And now we're in a place where you have, everybody's really bowing to a click track in a studio situation that became... And you have parts in music that sound like a lot, a lot like click tracks in modern music. So it seems like people are more and more um, willing to look at the scaffolding of time in the face, right? It's, it's become aesthetic in some sort of perverse kind of way. But how do you deal with a studio situation that is in time, like quantized time? But anybody that can play can do it and has mm -hmm. But even just to refer back to your comments about the orchestra and the, uh, the two and four, even here, and it's not a fault, but you're referring to performance time. Mm -hmm. and that's, uh, uh, interestingly, the absolutely most difficult concept for musicians to grasp. I almost never met anybody who understood that my objection to a metronome is based on the academic use of it. Mm. 
that when you learn how to play, you have to be out of time or else you're going to go, oh, wait, I made a mistake. No, wait a minute. I still made a mistake. No, hold on. Let me turn this off. Da da da. Okay. Da 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 do 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 do. And that is the element of learning that would have made everybody. Every. I, I I agree with you one hundred percent. That and I guess the way I always try to. There's a Stravinsky book. I mean, you probably read it, like the short Poetics of Mu Sound and Music. No, I didn't. It, it's wonderful. Not it's it's yeah. very short. It's great. And he describes. Um, he has a a working man's definition of music as uh as divided into organization of sound right and and that's that's how he he explains it and the idea is that let's say a songbird or a car horn isn't music because it hasn't been organized by you a sentient human being so for it to be music, the difference between let's say music and just sound is the fact that it, it is organized and i think when you expand on that notion you see i think you see that Music, re like rhythm, is where and when you put things. It's the act of organizing. And what you put in music is pitch, and how you put it in music would be timbre or articulation or something. And this whole, what you're saying is remove the exact location, remove the where and the when, so you can focus on what you put in there to where by the time when you have to actually focus on putting it in time, you know the components well enough to just throw them in their appropriate places which I think is absolutely true. But I think like I would, as a person that does practice with a metronome, I would never approach a, a fresh piece of music that way. I would always map out what's going on and then maybe like use some sort of grooving situation to kind of massage the things into their places a little bit deeper, right? Well, again, you're talking about performance. It's the yeah. one thing that musicians have the worst and hardest time grasping. The notion that learning is not a performance-oriented experience. That mm. before I can perform, I have to learn how to play. And the way you learn how to play is to learn the, what I consider the true language of music. I've never liked the use of, well, music is a language and we've learned it by ear as children and this and that. That doesn't answer the question that how do we as adults, not children, because we don't learn like children, how do we as adults uh, imp improve the playing uh, capability in our lives? And the way we do it is only through two ways. It's by being self-taught or in charge of our own playing or by being trained in music. So even here, you're referring to learning a piece, then performing a piece. I'm not even there. I'm mm. I it being to the left, left meaning, well, in, in Israel, it's being to the right, <laughs> you know? So you, you and, and a lot of Israeli musicians and may not have gone to the right enough, whereas a lot of, uh, you know, a European and American and South American musicians may have not gone to the left enough which is before even performance is regarded, people talk about scales. And you know why they want to perform them? Scales are not meant for performance. They're not even usable for performance. There's this odd thing, a notion of, well, how do I apply uh, these things? What we practice is not applicable. No one in America applies a verb in their conversation. They just don't. No one in America applies uh, a, a gas pedal uh, pressure and reduction as an application. We don't do those things. What we do is we learn things and become performers in the idiom. So when when what when I'm am I on here? You're on. I don't have. Oh, do I have a click? Uh, hold on. I I, I was actually going to get ready for you. Uh, <laughs> oh, I think I'm on here. Yeah. Am I on? Is there a click here? Should be. I can oh. provide you one on my end if you need it. That is weird. I don't know why to... Wait. Oh, damn it. <laughs> okay, this is terrible. <laughs> I'd, I'd better do something about this. Oh, wrong note. 
no, wrong note. Let me slow this down. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. And that's the nature in the, in the 10 second demonstration. Now, if I do this every day with real perfect music, uh, sorry to interrupt you, real perfect okay. musical information, I'm going to become a better bass player. Bass players mm -hmm. in particular say, we want to get better, I want to get better. If they did for real, I believe they would do what it takes. But bass players are distracted by a great deal of non-applicable and non-practical and non-result-oriented practice. They want to have fun, but fun is not a, a, a credo of practicing. Practicing mm. is a credo of practicing. I mean, I don't particularly see practice well as being fun or awful. It's just practice. You learn, you know, for college students, it isn't awful or 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 great or happy or sad. It's just we got to learn, you know, the the the, the law or so medical. If, if I understand you correctly, you're saying. I had to tell you what you're saying, but uh, I just want to paraphrase to see that I understand. You're saying that some sort of deep learning and patient learning in a way that's forgiving to yourself and just not, not even forgiving may, might not be the right, but patient and out of time leads to some sort of deeper internalization that maybe by the time of performance, you'd be able to just shoot out all these things in a more natural way. Everything you said, I would agree with right up to the word performance. Okay, so why is this separation between practicing and performance so dramatic in your view? Because learning is one thing and playing is another. Mm -hmm. Learning and playing have no connection whatsoever because the goals are different. What's the goal of learning? To regard new information and uh, understanding what it is that will help us to play our instrument better. Mm-hmm. Playing is a spontaneous uh, outpouring of everything that we ha are capable of playing right up to that moment. We do it in, uh, do you speak Spanish? No. Okay, I want you to speak this and repeat this, then we'll do it for the camera. Sure. Uh, first, we'll do this. Repeat after me in English. Uh, after our podcast chat, we're going to go get something to eat. After our podcast chat, we're going to go get something to eat. Okay. Después de hablar con el podcast, tú y yo vamos a ir para comer algo. Uh, tú sabes para de podcast. Mm, I can't do it. Well, why not? Yeah, it's just, I, I guess the way I was trying to memorize it was a sound that kind of entered my mind and evaporated about half a second after you finished speaking. All right, that's a fair analogy. I'll give you another one. It was in time. You don't know the words and you can't play it. But if yeah. I say to you, después el podcast. Después el podcast. Tú y yo. Tú y yo. Podemos ir. Podemos ir. Para comer. Para comer. Now. In this mechanical, slow, out of time, even though you may not know exactly what you were saying, but mm -hmm. it's not enough, we're not in a lesson here. You spoke Spanish better in 10 seconds because you heard it out of time. Because learning music is basic training, or Simon says. You know what Simon says is? when mm -hmm. you, uh, Simon says, do this, you do it. Simon says, do this, you do it. Simon says, you do this, you do it. Learning is Simon Says, and if people did Simon Says for a month, they would be significantly better musicians. Well, I mean, th there's something about, I would, I would say, memory and, and, and the example you gave. And I think that even if I do the a thing the opposite way, which I have you parrot rhythms, I think you would notice that there's a sort of parroting memory that can occur with very small bits of information. And then there's kind of a, a thing that would disappear. And I think this is related. Like, for instance, if I, if I go to you and I go like, da 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 da
repeat that rhythm with no problem. And if I extend it by a few beats, like I say, you still have no problem. Right. But if it was a four beat, I think at, at that point, most people would be like, I'm not even... I can't even regard number one, like what happened in measure one. And I think the reason is that past a certain amount of information, the mind goes from a parroting mode to a listening in the moment mode. And this is why people's, like when you play bass solos, it's so interesting to listen to because it, unlike a BB King solo where it's a, a short phrase and then you hear an echo of it in your own mind, it draws you into the moment, right? And you're, I'm, I'm when I when I hear you playing in a show, I'm completely with you, but I don't I have no idea what you just did, because well it's reasonable I've heard players I don't know what they did until I transcribe or analyze them but um, learning is supposed to be small pieces Charlie changed my life every week with a like I I could show it to you he gave me two lines of music, two lines. Uh, That was one, and then, sorry, I, I'm not a good pianist. Now, those two lines and the assignment that he gave me, I would learn the first line. I wouldn't learn two lines. ba 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 da ba da ba ka da ka da 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 I wouldn't, but I would learn da ka da ka da ka da ka da da That to me is academic solidity. It's a, it's a firm and perfect way for me to learn. And if I had this instrument and I'm playing, mm -hmm. that already makes me a more capable musician than if I do it again and, and do it in another key and keep changing these things. I'm becoming skilled in perfect elements of music and perfectly executing them on the bass. This, now, this, what gig, it says, we'll go to gigs, can anybody possibly be challenged in? I'm a liberated guy. There isn't a, I feel, I feel, I don't think there's a thing in music that I can't play on planet Earth just about. Mm -hmm. At least it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. I, my God, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I can't do this if it's expected. I, I, I do anything. I, I, That's because of the way I learned. In part. I, I actually really identify with you know your school of thought and your, I guess, um, what would be the word for it? Your your um, philosophy. The hell, well, the philosophy, but it's it's the resolution of the information you take in. I've been talking to a lot of gypsy jazz players on this uh, podcast. You know, who are some like Gizmo Graf, the guy that I was playing yesterday, was on here was on here yesterday for an interview. And the way these people learn is by taking very long phrases that mainly Django Reinhardt played or people that followed him. And they would learn it. If, if you were teaching me Spanish word for word, segment by segment, they would take an entire lick, a long thing, and play it thousands and thousands of times. And then since they all start playing rhythm guitar, that's kind of like a context that they learn first. And then with time, they learn how to apply. So everything is completely non-separable from performance and from time. And this guy's dad would sit in this and play rhythm guitar with him the whole time while he was getting his shit together for 15 years, playing these long phrases. And over time, he has some sort of freedom kind of that's working in retrospect where he can change things up. He was showing me, he didn't have words to describe it, but he was talking about rhythmically displacing some things. But the resolution that you work with in music really allows you to put together the phrases on the fly. And I can see how that's, that's the beauty of learning a small chunk of music or a line that Charlie would give you or half of a line. Cause then you know, I, I always I, I equate it to Legos, but they're working with big Legos, so they keep erecting the same structures. And you're dealing with the units that make up the unit of Lego, so your structures are, shift more. Well, um, I'll go back to the gypsy guitars. From the way you described it, it's a self-taught experience. Mm -hmm. Jamming, playing, it isn't a school of lessons, as it were. As it were, it's it's a sort of a hang jam, interactive, non 
I would call it non-scholastic, non-academic approach to learning flamenco or gypsy guitar playing. Mm -hmm. That fulfills one of the two ways that I said that people learn. We're self-taught or in charge of our own. And self-taught is a broad, it's, a, it's an endless uh, vision of learning. Mm -hmm. it, there is no, there are no limits. It's self-taught is whatever I wish to do is acceptable. It's doable. In the academic, it isn't. And, and to answer your two-bar thing, uh, I'll go back to my old Spanish lessons. The first verb that we learned was hablar, which is an AR verb. And, it, and then after you learn hablar or an AR verb and what they are and how to conjugate them, then you went to ER verbs, comer with an ER, and finally vivir, which is an IR. So Spanish in general is constructed upon three more or less only verb uh, conjugations, talk, live and to talk, to live, to eat. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason I say that is ahora, si yo quiero hablar y no tengo que pensar mis pensamientos, pero por toda la experiencia, por, estudi por estudiar, y yo, yo viví, estaba con muchos latinos, y por los estudios que tuve ahora, por hablar con usted o con cualquier persona, yo puedo expresar todo lo que quiero expresarme solamente porque I learned little pieces of Spanish at the beginning. Now, I'm not showing off, and I made some mistakes, so I'm still a work in progress, but I can hang with Latin people all over the world, and I just use it as an example. I was 35 years old, I, I didn't speak a word of Spanish, and now I do seminars in Spanish, I hang with Spanish, I go days without speaking a word of English. And mm. I'm a New York Jewish guy, <laughs> you know, and here I am. And the benefit is there, and if musicians, and, it, and everything that I say, the controversy is, is I don't believe that 95 plus percent of base education is worthy of regard. And the reason is, in part, as yourself, bass players cannot separate learning from performance. It's okay. just a mental ob obstruction to realize it. And if bass players who pay to, to be taught simply want to learn, it's so easy. And you just sit down and you learn things. You practice. Don't be perfect. Just practice it. Take the metronome, put it away, because it isn't a performance. My time is, is excellent, mm -hmm. but anybody like me, I'm not, I'm not better or special than anybody else. Anybody with the training or experience, they all have good time. I saw a thing the other day of Tal Wilkenfeld mm -hmm. playing with Herbie Hancock, and Herbie was bending, twisting, bumping, ch changing the harmony. To, he went out of time, in time, and he did it on a song that is a, is a hard song unto itself, uh, uh, actual proof. Had Vinny Aliuta, who was twisting, bumping, twisting the time and doing rhythm. And Tal is just plowing straight through this. And I'm sitting there listening, trying to find how I can keep that thing going. And she can do it better than I can. So um, there is a, a skill level that comes from experience that... Um, is different than the training element because while she's amazing at that, I might say I'm a better soloist and possibly have uh, other melodic ideas that she or other players may not have. That's all. Mm -hmm. I pursued that. So that's the one thing that I really find weak in bass. I'm a little bit detoury because I didn't. Have no, no, no. Wonderful. I love it. I haven't prepared any of this, but that's the one thing that bass educators worldwide, I I really dare say where worldwide is like. Asking guys, what do you want to practice? What do you want to learn? And I feel like when any teacher does that, they in instantly have abandoned their responsibility as a teacher. Because what does this? What does the student know about it? Hi, welcome sure. to medical. Welcome to medical school. What do you want to work on today? <laughs> and then guys say, "Well, medicine is more important than music." And that's when I know that these guys, what they really think about music, because there have been people that lost their health, their families, and their lives over music. And while I don't recommend that, I do say that there are people dead serious about it to the point where it became rather equal to the same interest that a medical or law student has. And I'd like to see base education change. Unfortunately, it's a, whoops, look who's there. <laughs> I'd agree with that 100%. I guess this is, I want you to talk about talent. 
what what is musical talent? You have you're an educator. You see a lot of people. A yes. Lot of, a lot of folks, you know, seem to have uh, self fulfilling, very gloomy prophecies about themselves for feeling untalented. And a lot of people, maybe, unta- how do you see it? Do you see it as a? Wh- how would you define musical talent? Uh, the ability to, to feel and represent music differently and naturally, maybe than than someone who doesn't have that same. Uh, propensity for it. I, I'm a naturally talented musician, but I'm not as naturally talented as Jaco Pastorius was. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I have my skill set and I'm definitely born to be a player. I know that. I know that. That I knew as a child. I knew that. But there are people that were born with better DNA t- tools than I have. Hold on. I got I to gotta let her out. Sure, sure. Um, Want to go out? Yeah, you can go. Yeah, Nina. Want to go out? Nina, I'm doing an interview. You got to go. <laughs> Thank you. See you later. You see, music is regarded as an entertainment to many people. And because it isn't that challenging, you don't really have to be that talented in order to do it. I mean, a lot of people own golf clubs and aren't probably ever going to get onto the PGA. I mean, but if you take, I think that golfers learn how to play golf better than bass players do, because at least these, a lot of these guys, not all of them, go to the golf pros at the clubs there or try to take lessons in order to eke out a pleasurable interaction with their golf game, you know, uh, where they do it well, just for the satisfaction. And uh, uh, bass players, I would encourage them to do or follow suit, but a lot of guys don't really. And so in a sense, even the simple element playing is compromised. So if they don't have talent and haven't done the practice, that would at least give them a modicum of skill for life. One Mm -hmm. year of proper training to to understand the fundamentals of language, because again, language is is based on notes. It's not based on, on mere verbalization. Because then you end up sounding like an American hillbilly in 1920s. They didn't. They all learn English by year, and they all and and they lived in, in a great deal of poverty and and had difficult communicating. I mean, there was compromises literally to life itself. Of course, we were in a depressed kind of, uh, you know, the crash and all. But there are, there are, a oh, payback. What's the word? Uh, the, you're going to get this karma. There, there, there's a payback for what we do or don't do. So bass players have consigned themselves to ignorance, Mm -hmm. some of us. And by the mere fact that they're trusting the wrong teachers, I feel, and not doing what could be done, that gives them skills for life. They'd figure out how to groove, how to play, how to hear, how to interact. Uh, It's all there if they knew where to put their fingers on the neck beyond a song. So if they're not talented, why not train as if you have a higher goal in music, mm. that benefit, and then go play rock songs because it isn't the style of music that's a problem or anything else. Everybody can function in rock because it's a predictable art form. It doesn't put it down. It's, it's a line. It's a thing. It's, it's predictable. It begins and ends here. Jazz, of course, and improv music is limitless, which makes it harder, but ever the more rewarding for guys like me, perhaps like you. Mm-hmm. to experience but not everybody has to follow my way of playing so my only interest is to make sure people recognize that learning is not what they think it is and I'm very concerned about how teachers are not telling students what I am certain is the truth of learning it's not about playing it's not about gigging it's not about art it's not about any of that it's about factual functional thing that you could find a guy in a in a in a uh, in a in a auto shop who knows more about a carburetor than a guy that has owned and played a bass for 25 years like because i get guys online i own a bass i've been playing for 25 years and i don't mean any harm but i know they've been playing the same songs for 25 years yeah yeah essentially essentially okay i want them to go higher and hope they go i i think that's a very that's very well put, and that's prob- very true. That's a, that's a real problem. People people are limited by their amount of uh, dedication, curiosity, and also the quality of their teachings. Um, let's talk a little bit about grooving, which is 
essential to your uh, to your instrument, and you do very well. And also, it seems to me to be one of the rarest transitions in adults. I, you you very seldomly see somebody who doesn't groove begin to groove past a certain point in their development. Okay. Have you had a lot of success taking people who can't seem to kind of put the notes in the music and watch them cross this barrier? Yes, because I would tell them to not improvise when they're providing a bass part. And mm. when I told them that, it was solved right then and there. I said, sing a bass line verbally. What? Sing a bass line. So um, I have my amps here. They're over at the um, recording sure. of Jack Bruce. So I don't know if you can hear this. But guys would play grooves and stuff. And... And I would say, whoa, sing a bass line. Okay, play that. Now repeat that. And I said, it's solved. I said, if you could play your, your thing in, in terms of one bar or two bar, or four bar uh, uh, chunks of music, you're grooving. And I keep picking up and putting down the bass. <laughs> and you can change keys. So the groove is essentially the repeated element at least in a great part, because groove mm -hmm. can happen in solos, it can happen in free form, but for the sake of the understanding of what groove is to, at least to bass players or whomever is listening, is that groove tends to be repeated things and almost, almost entirely in 4-4. Four, four. Mm -hmm. So in the simplistic regard of the elements to play a groove, anybody could do it. And if you listen to most music, if not nearly all music of nearly all contemporary, I go for bass, if you know, I know you're a guitar player, sure. but you, you know, listen to all contemporary bass playing just about since the beginning of this instrument, just about everybody plays with a groove mm -hmm. in their particular genres of music. So some have that sort of uh, staccato funk, a, a, a Rocco Prestia, then you get a McCartney kind of a groove in uh, Dear Prudence or something like that. You know, uh, uh, do you follow what I'm saying? Absolutely. Uh, the, the variety of styles change, but the authenticity denotes its own groove. So it's simple. It's beyond simple. I've never understood the fascination and the emphasis on providing or emphasizing playing something that essentially is a mandate of bass. You can't be a bass player without playing in time. I mean, it's so utterly obvious that I've never been quite sure when bass teachers decided to state the obvious as if it was an important lesson. You listen to uh, some records, CDs, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, yeah, I ain't that. Files, files. Files. <laughs> and you listen and you imitate and you practice what you hear, then you go to your bass lesson and learn the, 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 the approach note or the, the reading elements that I prescribed or described. And then you go out and do a jam and then maybe you do a rock gig and then the next day you put on the headphones again and imitate. And you've covered your entire education and saved yourself $30,000 a year in tuition fees. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but does, does it, is it a possibility that you're just a talented guy who understood a lot of things about time intuitively? Well, as I mentioned, I mean, the, the history of bass seems to say that the answer is no. Mm. If you look at the history of the instrument and pick any record of contemporary nature or beforehand, um, somebody played me something the other day and it was a surfy, a surf, you know, like a Dick Dale kind of thing. A do 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 do. Uh -huh. Something like that. And it was a bass player playing a blues on it. And it wasn't great note choices, but the guy was in time. Yeah. It's too obvious. Nobody plays a groove and loses 
the group to look for a correct note. It doesn't exist. Nobody has a problem with groove if, if they know how to play. Everybody can play a groove if they're experienced in the style and experienced as players because that's the, lo the logical result of playing. Else why play? If people can't groove, it's a perfect sign that they're not yet good enough as bass players. That's all. Mm. Okay. The light goes off. I'm not as good as I thought I was. Let me put in another three to six months and figure out what's happening. By the way, let me work... The reason why working on notes is so great is because it puts your fingers on this device, the neck, for a reason. I mean, the first reason that a bass was built was to represent pitch. Mm -hmm. And it's so obvious, you can see the frets on it. <laughs> the very first uh, nature of a bass guitar is to represent pitch, not groove, not feel, pitch. Mm -hmm. And when bass players recognize that pitch is actually the first aspect of playing, of learning, of art, of academic, the very, 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 very first earliest principle, most, most to the left in America and most to the right in Israel, principles. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, if people learn that the first thing, now what did I just play? I played the Hatikva and I played it. What's the first thing I had to regard? The pitch, the note, the note, the note. It wasn't a performance that I did except for as a quickie for us. Mm -hmm. When bass players learn that, a lot of bass players are going to be asked to leave bass education and guys that are qualified as teaching what pitch and notes and harmony is, which is the way that it's been proven, proven, the only way that has been proven to learn how to play better is by written music, will be asked to come in. Then things will go up and I'll stop writing columns that make people angry. <laughs> Look, well, if guess... people want to shut me up, all they got to do is uh, go to a music teacher. <laughs> I mean, and I'll stop, you know, busting their balls. I guess I, I'm not even aware. I'm, I'm not a part of the bass community. So you're, I, I'm, I'm stepping into this fight in like round 12. But, but what is the way that if I go to a standard bass lesson, what, what would I be taught in lesson one? What is the wrong way to do it? Well, the very first thing, and, and this, this is just a... It is absolutely insupportable that a teacher would say to a student, okay, what do you want to work on? Mm -hmm. In part because no matter what they want to work on, they still have to learn the notes. That's the thing about, there was, uh, I think Steve Bailey at Berkeley mentioned this, where there's a right teacher for the right student. And it occurred to me that any student whatsoever, whoever is uh, looking to learn, no matter if they're rockers, jazzers, bluesers, gospel, funk, soul, classical, uh, or any approach whatsoever, the notes are the same notes, and practically all these styles have major and minor in them. So whatever one's goals are isn't important because they first have to learn how to play and be taught how to play, and one teacher should be able to teach a hundred guys, should mm -hmm. be able to teach the rocker, the jazz, or the blues, or the guy that wants to be a studio guy he has to learn learn how to read and play notes. The guy that wants to play rock has to learn how to play the notes of rock and adjust the amps and find out how to get the tone for it and the attitude for it. You want to be an, a gospel player, you got to play notes in major and minor because gospel is based in major and minor in a great deal. So the common flavor of music is, is that there is no, by logic, and by history, by historical precedence, there is no really right teacher for the right student unless you're really, really good. When you get really, really good, then you say, look, I know everything that I, you know about the precedences that, uh, of music. So now, but I don't understand, like I'm going with that guy, uh, JJ, he specializes in something. So th what do you want to learn, Jeff? I want to learn about motion and harmony. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done it in 1972. When I went sure. to Berkeley or, or with it, because I'm not able to do that. I, that's why there's really no such real justification for the right teacher, for the right style, in my opinion. Well, let me ask you this. What would be, I guess, the time and rhythm equivalent of learning things at a high level 
to you, like what what would you how would you practice at your level knowing all the things you know you know all the notes you've practiced for years what what's kind of a rhythm or a time thing that you would do now me yeah to get better at okay well I'll tell you one thing that I well one I'm going to learn from JJ that's one thing because I know my harmony needs attention the second is is after hearing the herbie Hancock performance you I want to go back and listen to that a lot to see if I can't keep a quarter note going through it like Tal Wilkenfeld did so successfully because I think I would have gotten lost half a dozen times. And the problem with, is with me is when I hear something, I go with it. Mm. You know who else is like me? Mm. We can't handle out of time stuff. Oops. Scott, Scott Henderson. Oh, yeah. Scott and I have shared the same thing is that we're, if, if it's not an eighth note or subdivided divided eighth or quarter note thing, we're screwed. And when I heard Herbie playing out, like dun 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 da 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 And he was so elastic and I wanted to play boom 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 and I started to go like into that. Did I lose you? No, no, I see you perfect. Okay. So I'd like to up my rhythm uh, ability because I do get lost when I hear things in that fusion top end thing because I'm not interested in fusion much anymore. I'd really sure. rather be a rocker or a jazzer and kind of lean it out. That's just my prayer. And classic, I'll sure. love it. Sure. But, but so you're saying like working on holding down time when other people are fucking with it. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to find a way to hear them and ignore them at the same moment because my, I go right with them. I, I mean, mm. that's my training. My training was not to ignore, but to go with. Mm -hmm. And I did it so well that I can't ignore anymore. I, I play with Dennis Chambers, and he'll do it on purpose. We'll be playing, and he'll suddenly do this, you know. And, so how, and I'm how like, oh, you motherfucker. <laughs> And, when, when, mother, and he's laughing at me because he knows it fucks with me. <laughs> and yeah, it, it seems supporting, um, especially modern drummers behind their solos where you have to do very specific syncopated hits when they go past a certain point of fucking with time, it tends to be very hard. And I think these guys practice also with machine loops. So they rely on a certain amount of support from a rhythm section that's unreasonable <laughs> past a certain amount of fuckery. <laughs> they have the fuckiosity to do perform fuckery on us oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that uh, there are master musicians so I listen to them solo still I mean I, I heard a couple of oh I remember who it was Mark O'Connor the violinist mm -hmm. did a, a solo on something that floored me and uh, I copied the link so I'm going to transcribe that I'm just thrilled because every time I hear something that I can't do, I want to learn how to do it. And that's just my DNA. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Keep riding that wave, dude. <laughs> do you feel like, what, do you feel like uh, you're still getting better all the time? Oh, yeah. And the better is simply describable as, ah, I learned that. And I didn't know that. And mm. even my bass playing has changed from it because remember like I, I made a career out of uh, not doing what people did as inspired by miles uh, actually I, if, if people played an act I'll tell you about this if people played an active bass I wouldn't if they played at five I won't if they unless for pro professional reasons um, if you know they used uh, 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 tweeters I, I fortunately have come not to like the tweeter bass sound. And I just won't have it. So for me, and um, Miles said once, Miles was famous, you know, the ballads that he played, he was famous for it. Mm -hmm. And one day he just completely stopped doing it. And Keith Jarrett asked him, why did you stop playing ballads? And Miles answered him, I stopped playing ballads because I love to play ballads so much. Mm. And that little statement changed my life. It got me to recognize that being in denial, being in discomfort in an uncomfortable musical situation, at least at certain times, which I find many people can't tolerate, but is exactly the 
the the the the, gro the the fertile ground to grow a style, an original view, uh, something different. Miles denied himself something that he loved, so he could be in something that was uncomfortable and rise above it. It was a mm. brilliant philosophy, but it works for a guy like Miles because he was already so far past the formative years that everything he was doing was entirely and 100% based in musical principles, art. That's where mm. performance applies. But I wouldn't go to Miles to particularly learn how to play. I'd buy his records. Sure, sure. Makes perfect sense. Mm. Jeff? Yes, sir. I'd like, I'd like to thank you for your time. This, is, this has been amazing. I would definitely love to have you again and talk about other things. Now I'm going to have to go and look at some bass lessons and see why these, what these fools are doing and how they're Jeff poisoning. Fools. They're not fools. I, they? I know you were being silly. I know you didn't mean it. But let yeah. me explain something about people. They're not foolish. They're being misled. A lot of guys are young and they're naive. And they're, you know, there's a funny thing that goes on in the bass world. It, there's a kind of a deniability yeah. factor, a dysfunctional family thing where a family, can I say this and then we'll end sure. it? Sure. No, go ahead, Jeff. There are families that have dysfunctionality and will not talk about it in order to completely avoid the pain or discomfort of discussing their dysfunction. Mm. Um, I know this because I had therapy and it was uh, uh, we came up that you have to allow for the discussion and the facing of the dysfunction in order to see what it is and see if you can move past it. Bass players are not willing to hear that their favorite players might be magnificent players and magnificent people and the schools are lovely set up, but they're not happy to hear that maybe the content isn't worthy of regard. And I don't mean harm when I say these things. Mm. I, don't, I mean no harm, but I'm not governed by the wish of a group of people who don't want to hear about it. Mm -hmm. Why do you always bring this up? You're always talking. Why don't you do you and let them do them? And I'm reminded of government debate. I'm reminded of debate on the Internet. I mean, as an American, we were born. This country was born on criticism. Mm -hmm. That is a tenet of, of, of America that caused us to split from England. We criticized the, the manner that the, the America, the colonists were being treated. And it's, it's not a cold or rude or bad thing. It hurts. It could be unpleasant. But if there's something to be found there, and you know, we should pursue it. But base, the base community is a little dysfunctional. They don't want to hear us uh, face things. And just to end, I'm open to the same kind of criticism. Sure. Anybody can say, you know, Berlin and his music, and he's always talking about his music. I think people can also criticize my... Yeah views and show me where I'm wrong and show where it's wrong well, and, it seemed... and unhelpful to learn music in an academic situation. So if I can say this about different people mm -hmm. and that they can certainly do the same, you know, about well, it seems to me absolutely like the, the battle that you are participating in is so, is so deep and so intense because you're presenting a real path through it and the, the opposition is saying there are many many paths through it so it's it's really like you versus postmodernism right it's like there's like many many viable interpretations of how bass playing could go and how training should be and this is just and and that's what that's what they're opposing you with well while you kind of have a method and and you should learn the notes you should learn how to read and shut the fuck up until you do <laughs> well you, you know you're right, and I'm not ignoring you. There's there's a quote that I wrote down from uh, because it was an interesting quote. If you'll give me a second, or sure, sure, find the quote. Okay, wait one second. I have it here. It was actually from a tell a pen a pen Gillette. Pen Gillette. Mm -hmm. uh, gosh darn it! If I don't find it, oh. No, hold on. Holding on. Hold on, hold on. Okay, I'm hold. going back up. I'm starting from the bottom. If I can't find it, then you can just cut this out. Or... 
I'm not cutting anything out. We're going to look at you on your phone. I'm going to go on my phone and write Penn Jillette too. <laughs> okay. Darn it. What was the gist? He essentially gist? said, uh, and I wrote it down. It was such, it's probably here. I know how people feel. He said that the, when people, oh, here it is. The more liberal people who say that there are many paths to truth, just go and find your way, is the way that you talk to a child. Mm -hmm. I bristle at that. That's Penn uh, Gillette. Uh, he's part of a, a team. Uh, I agree with you 100%. And tell her. The more liberal people who say that there's many paths and go and do your thing or whatever works for you is the way that you talk to a child. And I have to agree. If there's many ways, then why pay to learn at all? Right. If there's right. many what? ways, just go and do it. Or uh, Yeah, I mean, it's ignoring some very true thing. Like, what's, what's the difference between a Charlie Parker and a kid holding a saxophone then? Right. If there are many ways, that it implies that there's no that every that also the 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 thing you get to the kinds of playing you get to are all equal too, and that's just not true. Experientially, we hear Miles Davis or Charlie Parker, and we have a certain kind of reaction. So we want to get to a certain place. So obviously, if you want if you know where you want to get to, not all paths are equal. If you do it as a self-taught musician, not all paths are equal. If you pay to be taught, all paths are just about the same. Because Miles and Charlie learned the same harmony, the mm -hmm. same ways through different sources. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. Okay, so we learned that uh, the base world is, is uh, deeply psychologically diseased. It's Oedipal. Everybody wants to kill Ray Brown and have sex with Jocko. And uh, <laughs> we got a... <laughs> We got to cure it, but that's that's awesome, dude. Yeah, I, really, I really appreciate your outlook and your patience and your time. No, your, thank you, your, thank you. And and he, it was a great time, and we had no metronomes. No, but uh, I'm I'm actually I'm actually with it, you know. Um, I think I think you're onto something there. So, dude, really appreciate it, and I th I'm sure a lot of people will too. I hope so. And if they disagree, of course they should. It's it's people have to decide for themselves about anything. Okay. That, so that, I, that is, I'll, I'll put I'll put your uh, home address so you can get the anthrax and envelopes. Okay. Um, that's the video. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeffy. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Danny. Yeah. Talk soon. Be gesund. Okay, I will. Ciao. Bye.